or we might say, we can use language, this is a, similar to the Fry argument that we considered earlier, um, and I'll bypass that for the sake of argument, have immortal souls. Have immortal souls. That's why we have rights. Human beings have rights because we have immortal souls. <laughs> Dolphins and ducks, porpoise and pigs uh, lose. Uh, they, don't, they don't have immortal souls. And therefore they don't have any rights. But see, again, if you th we think about the, the, the concept of having an immortal soul, that makes a difference to what happens after you die. If you have an immortal soul, you go on living. But what difference can it possibly make, logically, to your status while you're alive, before you die? It's, a, it's again, a fallacy of irrelevance. It, it, the two ideas are not connected in any logical fashion. And in fact, for the sake of argument again, I'll give you this idea from C.S. Lewis, who some of you might know from, uh, from his uh, fictional writings. But C.S. Lewis is a great Christian theologian in the 20th century. And he said, you know what, I agree. Animals don't have souls. And we do. And people said, oh, okay, I guess we can pretty much do anything we want to to them then, huh? Because they, I mean, they don't have a soul. I said, Lewis said, no, no, no. You don't seem to understand. If they don't have a soul, then they don't have a life after they die. Yeah. Well, if they don't have a life after they die, then this is the only life they have. Yeah. Well, then we should make it as good as we can. Because this is the only one they've got. You know, rather than, rather than they're lacking a, a, a mortal souls being a, a blind check for us to exploit them, it becomes a compulsion to protect them, to, to benefit them. So not only is this, I don't think, re relevant to, logically relevant, but it actually reaches a, a very different conclusion. Well, suppose the, the candidate is our subjects of a life. That's what it is that underlies our attributing rights to you and your attributing rights to me and our attributing rights to the little baby and, and uh, mentally disadvantaged disabled person, they're, 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 something is happening to them. They're, they're subjects of a life. There are objections to this because, see, if we take that, if we take this view that it's the being subjects of a life, then the other animals that I talked about earlier, the other animals that were shown in the videos earlier, have rights. They have rights because they're subjects of a life, just as you and I are. But there are going to be objections to this. They lack rights because they're not human. Oh, please. I mean, if that's not just sheer prejudice, I mean, uh, there's nothing about the, notion of, about the notion of a right that requires that someone be a human being. That's not part of the meaning of the word right, moral right. Uh, they don't understand rights. Well, neither does the baby. Neither, you know, you can't say... You can't, we can't disqualify elephants because they don't understand rights unless we're willing to disqualify young children and babies. They don't respect our rights. I suppose what this means is if I'm out on the Serengeti plane, walking around minding my own business, and a lion sees me, a lion doesn't say, oh, that's Reagan, he has rights. Uh, I, I won't eat him for supper. I mean, what happens is, the, radio, the, the, the lion says, well, that looks like a plump some, you know, dinner to me, and boom, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, I'm done, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm toast, uh, so to speak. Uh, well, they don't respect our rights, but we don't require this in the human community. We don't require, take the case of a mentally disabled person who, who uh, say, accidentally sets fire to the house, uh, which can happen. Uh, we don't say uh, uh, that this mentally disabled person who doesn't quite understand what they're doing and so on and so forth, that not respecting our rights, you know, my property rights, is that part of the house. We don't say, well, that mentally disabled person doesn't have rights. We don't reason that way when it comes to human beings. So why would we reason that way when it doesn't come to human beings unless we're going to be prejudiced in favor of human beings? They're under our dominion. Oh, I got it. God gave them to us, that's right, didn't he? And it says so in the Bible, I mean, it says right there, 
and God gave us to the gave, gave the animal source and so on and so forth. And that's why they don't have rights. Well, I don't know what you think about about uh, uh, appealing to the Bible. I mean, I, I personally don't think that's a, an effective way of finding answers to lots of important questions. But at the same time, I recognize that it is a common way of doing things. And so it's important for, for animal rights advocates like myself to try to answer this question fair, fair and square. And here's the way I answer this question. If you look at what happens, what's said in Genesis, where this notion of dominion comes from, if we look at what's actually said there, it says, when God says we're given dominion over the animals, this is to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And if you remember back then in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were not wearing leather palms. And, and, and I mean, they were naked. They didn't have any clothes. Uh, so they weren't going out by, as I say, buying fur or buying you know, leather to clothes and so on. They, they were not interacting with animals as a source of clothing. And in fact, they weren't eating animals either. If you actually look at what it says in Genesis before the fall, uh, what it says in Genesis is that I give you herbs and nuts and every tree bearing fruit, and this will be your, your meat, this is your food. So when God gave us dominion, what he hoped for us would do, would he hoped we'd be animal rights advocates. He hoped we wouldn't kill them for, our, for their fur or their feathers or their skin, and he hoped we wouldn't raise them for their milk or their eggs or their cheese or their flesh. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy to say that, that under the original condition, uh, God wanted it, when God gave us to man, God wanted us to be animal rights advocates. I suppose this is, or this is true or something like it. Animals have rights. As subjects of the life, they have rights. Uh, they, uh, they have rights to liberty and to, and, and to bodily integrity and to uh, life. And then some of the practical implications of rights are trumped, and we can't justify injuring animals because of some social custom. We can't say, hey, listen, we've always been eating uh, meat here in, uh, uh, in Greece. Uh, it goes way, way back. We can't, that's not a sufficient justification for violating somebody's rights. You can't say for personal gain, you know, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and shoot some wild animal and really make a big impression because this will help me get a promotion in my work where my boss is a hunter. That's not a sufficiently good reason for violating somebody's rights. The public good, remember this, plus the, the experiment uh, with uh, syphilis, you can't justify violating the rights of individuals in the name of the public good. Well, if animals have rights, we can't do that either. And all these practical implications apply to the food we eat, the clothes we wear, how we learn, what we do for fun. They, define, they apply to the, all the dimensions of our day-to-day -day life. Remember I said animal rights advocates were not reformers. We're not after more humane treatment. We're abolitionists. We're trying to end the various ways in which we exploit other animals. We're trying to put the animal abuser industries out of business. That's what we're trying to do. We are, as I said, not working for larger cages, but for empty cages. Do animals have rights? As I said, I, you can't answer these questions in the media or in opinion polls or in examined traditions only by thinking independently and in the invitation of philosophy. Philosophy's invitation to us is think for ourselves. Think for ourselves. Using logic, being factually informed, freeing ourselves from prejudice. The purpose of my remarks and the purpose for my being here, for which I give you thanks again for the opportunity, is to extend the invitation of philosophy. Thank you.